Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Miriam, Microsoft Partnership Manager at Volo, and today we will have the pleasure of discussing the cloud adoption strategies and understanding what is exactly right for your business with David Khachatyan, who is Head of DevOps and IT Infrastructure at Volo, and Levon Hovanisian, Senior Technology Strategist at Microsoft. Hello, David. Hello, Levon. Thanks for being here with us. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you for inviting me. I will give a brief overview on Volo, since we have to give credit to an established IT services company with 17 years of experience. So from its seven offices, Volo serves globally known clients based mostly in the United States, Western Europe, and Switzerland. This said, the services encompass the complete digitalization and modernization cycles, including software development, web and mobile, and cloud services. It has been logical and demanded to follow the legacy applications modernization webinar with the one dedicated to cloud adoption, since the current IT industry developments prove these two concepts walk hand in hand. Well, we have recently observed the exponential rise of discussions on cloud adoption in the global IT landscape. Thus, we decided to dedicate this session of our webinar series to answering the main questions on this hot topic and uncovering the possible gray areas together with our experts who already do have years of expertise with clients and partners successfully adopting cloud. A valid question might arise here, whether the coming information is of value exactly for your business or enterprise. The fast forward answer is yes, and let me tell you why. Because cloud adoption is the solution for a long list of problems, needs or requirements, at least few of which would apply to your own case. Let me list a few now for the illustration. Whether you are struggling with your IT infrastructure costs and need reductions or optimization, whether you are looking for the best way to manage scalability, to improve resilience, agility, or eliminate IT disruptions, whether you are looking for the best way to build new technical capabilities, then cloud adoption topic is the one you should get more insights on. The numbers speak for themselves. As we can see, 94% of organizations with more than 1,000 employees, which means the enterprises, have at least part of their workloads in the cloud. Gartner predicts that in 2023, end-user spending is expected to reach nearly $600 billion, up from the $500 billion in 2022. And according to a recent study, 69% of enterprises are moving mission-critical information to the cloud. I believe statistics uh, proved our points as well. So uh, let's see the agenda for today. Uh, firstly, we will uh, briefly cover the first introduction with the potential customer. Then we will move on to the essential blocks of the cloud adoption framework, which are the strategy, planning, deployment and its management, and cloud governance. You can expect to hear about real-life cases of cloud adoption challenges and corresponding solutions. Also, please keep in mind that at the end of our discussion, we will have time for Q&A. So uh, please feel free to ask all of your burning questions in the uh, chat room below. And uh, I believe we're ready to start. Um, we will start off with uh, the uh, pre-discovery stage, the initial one uh, working on uh, potential cloud adoption. Uh, so David will give, uh, give us insights on how and what we need to know and why is this stage so critical. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, indeed, the discovery stage is an essential and critical step in the cloud adoption journey. And I would like to stress that the quality directly impacts the success of the cloud adoption, and we shouldn't miss any critical business attributes that can potentially alter the cloud adoption by this or that way. So coming to the question on what and how we discover, I would say that we need to gain 360 view of a customer, not only the general business character characteristics such as geography of operations, but capacity and size, reliability and performance and security, and in many cases, regulatory requirements that should be considered as well. Another more important topic for me uh, is the building of new technical capabilities and new skilling. And all 
uh, these nuances should be discussed and identified, of course. And it takes a joint effort by the team of multidiscipline professionals, such as cloud architects, DevOps engineers, business analysts, and software developers. And to get to the bottom of these questions and to correctly identify the client needs and requirements. Uh, thanks, David, for the insights on the first part of the puzzle. Uh, so um, just to wrap up, uh, before guiding the customer through the steps of cloud adoption, we do need to have initial information and understanding about the client. And now that we have completed the business pre-discovery session and identified all explicit and implicit client requirements, we can then move on to the cloud adoption framework. As Microsoft solution partners in all three Azure designations, the reason we have chosen to focus on the cloud adoption framework for Azure as a guide for this webinar is that it provides a structured and consistent approach to the cloud enablement, which our clients, uh, by the way, have always found very clear and helpful in guiding them on this journey. The cloud adoption framework starts with defining the strategy. So, Levon, uh, is there a universal one-size-fits-all strategy for cloud? And how do businesses define their cloud enablement strategy? No. Of course, we would love to have, but there is no strategy that can fit all. It depends on many aspects, like your motivation and goals to adopt cloud to your business, your timelines, your budget, your current infrastructure, and so on. For instance, if your goal is cost-cutting, in many scenarios, lift and shift, will not work for you. Lift and shift when you move your on-prem servers to uh, cloud virtual machines. But however, if you need to increase your site's availability or meet some compliance requirements as soon as possible, in that case, lift and shift can be acceptable strategy because it can be implemented relatively quickly. For cost cutting, I think you will consider uh, building or transforming cloud native applications. Or another scenario, you want to uh, adapt cloud to your business, but you have some sensitive data that just can't be moved to the cloud. In that case, we have hybrid scenario for you. So you see, depending on your goals, motivations, which is very important, and conditions, the strategy can be different. Uh, to your strategy, you need to gain consensus on the following. Clear motivation, why you're actually adopting the cloud in your business. Define business outcomes, what results do we expect, and business justification, how we are going to measure success. And one of the most important aspects is, of course, motivation. In our cloud uh, adoption framework, we have a list of motivations to consider, but actually you can have even more of them that we uh, haven't foreseen in Microsoft. The most popular scenarios, just from my uh, experience, is security compliance and uh, cost cutting. I mean, the reason, the motivation. For security, Azure not only, Microsoft not only invests billions to security, but we also provide wide range of security control services. I think I will speak about it a little bit um, later when we discuss governance as well. And more importantly, not more importantly, but again, very importantly, we provide certifications to our services. I mean, compliance certifications, like GDPR, other ICO certificates. So if you build your infrastructure on cloud, on Azure, uh, you can get covered from compliance perspective as well. One more motivation to move to cloud. So just to answer to your question, no, there is no uh, strategy to, to all. That's why the planning stage is so important. Uh, understood. Thanks for your points. But a quick uh, notion here. You mentioned also that cost cutting is one of the main motivations to mm -hmm. use the cloud. But uh, we have heard feedback that according to, for instance, the Azure pricing calculator, cloud prices are not always lower. Plus, mm -hmm. for a cloud, you have to pay, let's say, forever, while for on-prem infrastructure, you pay once. Yeah, yeah, of course, I see your point. But let me give some more details here. When we are speaking about cloud native applications, I mean, applications that build using cloud specific services that you just don't have on on-prem servers, obviously, or very hard to implement. 
In that case, this comparison doesn't make sense at all. You just can't compare. It, uh, you can compare when we are speaking about moving your on-prem Windows Linux server or databases to cloud. But even in that case, using uh, just Azure pricing calculator, I mean pricing of servers, absolutely not enough to uh, understand your cost effectiveness, to understand cost, uh, cost effectiveness of migration, you should consider so-called TCO, total cost of ownership, which is combination of acquisition cost that you already mentioned, plus operational costs. Uh, you understand what means operational costs, right? Pricing for electricity in your country, for cooling, for renting, and uh, everything, just maybe. Uh, we, Microsoft, provide TCO calculator. You can use it to understand effectiveness for yourself. But uh, in many scenarios, it, that's not that easy task. It's equation with a lot of variables. So from my perspective, uh, you will need help of specialized partner to understand to correctly estimate TCO for your solution. And to understand, is cloud adoption cost effective for you or not? Cloud is not a silver bullet of obvious. But again, just to repeat myself, Azure Calcutta is not enough. You need to consider acquisition cost and operational cost, which we call uh, call uh, total cost of ownership. But also I want to mention here, again, repeat myself, as I said at the beginning, when we are speaking about cloud adoption, we, need, uh, we mean more building cloud native applications than just lift and shift, although this is also approach that we can use. When you use when you build cloud native applications, it's much easier to get cost effectiveness here. Understood, Levon. Thanks um, for your great insights on the strategy part. Uh, so, just to give a brief summary, uh, a recap um, to consider the strategy part implemented, we should have a clearly defined motivations and desired business outcomes for the customer and a cloud adoption strategy chosen according to those. Of course, uh, taking into account uh, the TCO. Uh, so I believe, uh, shall we start the second part of the cloud adoption framework, the planning part? I assume uh, we will get a bit more technical um, here. Uh, so David, can you please share with us a typical planning process, what and who is involved, and some important technical aspects uh, that you consider important here? Uh, yes, exactly. As mentioned here, is where the technical process starts itself, breaking down the cloud adoption process into separate uh, actional items. I will make a reference to the discovery stage where I spoke about uh, new technical capabilities and skilling. In the planning state, the action item for the whole digital estate are set to the infrastructure, the applications, IT operations, cloud services and workloads. And I would like to refer to Azure Well Architectured Framework that guides us through all the important pillars of architecture excellence and gives us a lot of technical insights on how to achieve the best results, high quality incorporating all the pillars together. And referring to the excellent point Levon has mentioned, the planning process is completely dependent on the decisions made when deciding the strategy based on total cost of ownership, required services and performance, as well as desired business outcomes. But before uh, I get to the actual uh, implementation case, let me ask you a question on how satisfied are you with your overall cloud performance? And uh, as you see, uh, answers will be very satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied or dissatisfied. I will wait a bit for uh, uh, to get some answers and compare some statistics. Okay. Uh, I can see that majority of you are either satisfied or very satisfied, which is great. But let me tell you something, uh, and you wouldn't expect many of our clients were indeed overall satisfied with the cloud operations, simply because the connection between cloud performance and business problems was not explicit to them. 
and only after cloud modernizations, they were able to critically assess their previous performance, which was not actually satisfactory. Uh, I'm trying to make point here that if you have business problems related to IT, then most probably you need to revisit your cloud adoption planning, uh, surely uh, with a partner who knows what they are doing. In a, in a just brief example, uh, we have customers, uh, many of them, who migrated to the cloud by using a fleet migration approach. And finally, they started uh, struggling with higher monthly costs, uh, continuously rising computing utilizations, and lack of operational excellence. Well, and when we started with them a uh, strategy stage uh, to get all the details uh, and uh, planning, uh, in the planning stage, we define uh, Azure landing zones uh, using like uh, we, where we can map and save existing VMs. And uh, finally, we got uh, to uh, using a container-driven approach, uh, using Azure Container Kubernetes services, and we help them to modernize their applications to deploy and run on their container services instead of virtual boxes. Uh, by this, uh, uh, they optimized 45% of their cloud cost and got significant improvement of cloud operational excellence. And of course, they got uh, improved deployment and scalability, which is also quite important. And this is clear uh, illustration that once business objectives are reflected in the assessment of the digital estate and in the planning process, the objectives would most probably be achieved. Um, and here, the important point, uh, I will stress the absolute necessity of the senior level, high qualified team uh, with, uh, to have cloud architects, DevOps engineers, and operation managers should be involved in this process. Uh, thanks, David. Um, it was actually very clear that uh, with the explanation, you provided a real case. Um, it was a very... Um, clear and understandable, let's say. So uh, to plan the cloud adoption, uh, we need to firstly have a senior team, secondly, thoroughly discover the digital estate, and then define the landing zones, services, and clearly write down the technical steps the team has to follow. Um, so David, given that you mentioned services in your example, I would like us to get even more insights here in the environment design part, in particular, what are the top services used and how is the cloud environment generally designed? Oh, all right. I think it will be more clear if I approach the question from the end. Cloud environment is designed firstly through the solution uh, design document, including network architecture diagram, Azure landing zones, uh, literally cloud services, which says the whole environment and the process flow. Uh, and all these components are dependent on the previous stage, the planning. So for instance, if for a given client we have planned to containerize their application, then the Azure Kubernetes services will be among of the landing zone services. Uh, 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 of, or uh, other services that can potentially include it in the environment design, beside core services, uh, uh, they can include web application firewall, or observability and identity uh, services or other security tools that um, actually I don't want to overwhelm with do technical descriptions of the services but I would summarize that once the plan had been made on the process the environment design is according to the technical best practices will be done one of which is the usage of infrastructure as a code uh, which is a modern technology to set all cloud services, uh, such as identity, cloud networking, uh, databases, and uh, not less important resource organization that is tagging and naming conventions in the environment. And important aspects will be the cloud baseline standard for any organization, which is better, I think, to cover on the cloud governance is discussed. 
Uh, I would like to give an example of the case we had last winter when the client main objective was to enhance IT operations and accelerate cloud deployments. And that was achieved through the use of infrastructure as a cloud, infrastructure as a code, uh, where we mainly prefer to use Terraform, which uh, one of the main well-known and widely used infrastructure as a code tool. Uh, yes, thanks, David. Um, so again, I will do a quick recap. Uh, once strategy and planning stages are behind us in the cloud adoption journey, we need to clearly define the architecture, which is basically the cloud environment architecture. And infrastructure as code is one of the best practices for settling this infrastructure. Um, I believe here we might need some thoughts on the deployment process. Uh, so now, um, what are the usual services used in deployment once the workloads are already in the cloud? How important are the monitoring and backups as well as the support? Uh, and these sub-questions will be best answered if I generally cover cloud infrastructure observability, which allows to have live information about the cloud infrastructure state, including numerous aspects such as security, performance, uh, resources utilization versus capacity ratio, cost and the cost management, of course. The main benefit of having this is the ability to continuously optimize cloud operations KPIs, which are set for each cloud adoption journey separately. Uh, besides observability, the important part of the deployment activities uh, encompass the incident management system. Uh, criticality levels and precise workloads have to be identified in case of any potential incident, and they should be documented and delegated, of course. We do have standardized workflows actually uh, uh, in place and uh, uh, which are then customized and tailored for uh, the exact clients. Recently, uh, we, we had introduced a, a, an updated incident management uh, system considering uh, uh, customer goals such as service level agreement, uh, service level objectives and service level indicators which one of our uh, for one of our long-term customers and the the, the documentation they had uh, we reviewed uh, updated by providing in detail standard operational procedure and scope of work then we had uh, on-job training for respective team members and stakeholders this was just uh, for you to have a high level understanding of the process uh, to speak about the services, the most recommended ones uh, are uh, uh, management and governance services uh, in Azure, such as Azure Monitor or Azure Automation, uh, Azure Backup or Azure Site Recovery in case disaster recovery is the subject to consider. And uh, Azure policies, of course, are important to have uh, where you should consider management and governance. Uh, understood. Uh, so for the efficient deployment, it should be automated and the customer, surely with the guidance of the partner, uh, should have the ability to monitor live the Azure infrastructure to then correctly act on any possible incident. Also, uh, one important part of efficient deployment is having the backups and site recovery plans in place. Uh, so I believe before we summarize uh, with a few more examples and move on to the Q&A, uh, I would like to ask you, Levon, uh, for your expert insights on cloud governance, uh, which was mentioned um, throughout our webinar until now and which is the last part of our agenda, yet a very important one. Yeah, indeed, it's very important. Let's not forget that cloud is geographically distributed system we pay after usage model of pricing. So it's pretty easy to lose control of your consumption and which is, in my opinion, even worse, lose control on security and compliance. Mm -hmm. For example, you can create uh, accidentally, of course, a database that should contain user data outside of your region while you are going to store their new citizens data, right? So you will have GDPR problems or your engineer can unconsciously create too big virtual machines, unnecessarily big virtual machine. 
which would cause um, unexpected cost at the end of the month. These kind of examples are endless, actually. So it's safe to say that governance of your cloud infrastructure is not an optional nice to have thing, but it's absolutely necessary to have, to uh, adapt, and to use. Fortunately, Azure provides all necessary tools, tools for that. Um, I will open the tools list uh, immediately. I'm not going to name all, all the tools. David already mentioned many of them. Just a few examples. Azure policy. You can enable, a, uh, you can create, assign, and enforce policies for resources for Azure. Size of resources, regions where they can, can be created, even naming conventions. We have uh, Azure Monitor, David mentioned again, which is a tool to, for centralized monitoring of health and performance of your entire infrastructure. I would even add that if you have on-prem server, servers, I mean, you use uh, hybrid infrastructure, you can use Azure Monitor for monitoring your hybrid resources as well, like Azure resources, one, from one point of view. It's very important. One of my favorite services, Azure Security Center, centralized service that monitors your entire infrastructure for vulnerabilities, for, for example, unnecessarily open ports, uh, not encrypted sensitive data and everything, and gives score of your data. This is out-of-box service. Of course, you can activate additional services, etc. but you have out-of-box service that constantly monitors security and vulnerability of your uh, infrastructure. And of course, the pain, main pain point for many of us, Azure cost management, which is part of Azure governance as well. Service that allows to not only uh, monitor your cloud spend, but also forecast your spend. And which is also very important, you can set up budgets, for example, for each project. You can set up alerts for consumption. So if you get more consumption than you expected, you can be alerted. Of course, it will save you losing some money. And uh, even AI-based recommendation engine that will give you recommendations constantly how to optimize your servers. So we could recover from this perspective as well. Thank you, Levon. Um, I believe the uh, governance part um, is covered as well. Uh, we have some very valuable insights um, from you. And um, as we are coming closer to the end of our session um, before Q&A, once again, um, cloud adoption is a complicated and sometimes challenging process since you have to define strategy, plan well, set up the right cloud environment to then well manage and well govern it. Thus, you do need experts to guide you through this journey. Uh, so everyone, if you have any remaining questions that you would like uh, some one-on-one -on -one guidance uh, on from our experts, please let us know um, in the following poll, which is now visible on your screen. <clears throat> uh, Thank you. Uh, so uh, thanks so much, uh, David and Levon, for your excellent explanations and real life cases. Uh, just before Q&A, if I were to ask you to briefly summarize uh, today's session into key takeaways, uh, which points would you mention, Levon? Uh, you correctly mentioned that Azure adoption is a pretty hard journey. So from my personal, not personal, professional experience, it's very important to choose strong and experienced partner to guide you with this. That can define your failure or success in this journey. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Levon. Uh, and David, which points would you emphasize here? Uh, uh, I would like to emphasize the uh, an important, very important point is the methodology and uh, a process that uh, in any case should be used uh, best practices should be included in order to have best results. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, Azure Web Architecture Framework or Cloud Adoption Strategy and Planning are uh, important points to always consider when you are uh, 
a moving or modernizing uh, uh, your cloud your, uh, your cloud infrastructure. Um, yeah, thanks for noting that. Um, and um, I believe um, here is the time where we can move on to the questions which have been asked and um, we have um, here. Uh, well, uh, if you ask me uh, to moderate here, I will um, uh, read the question to then uh, one of our speakers will cover the answer. Uh, so the first one here would be, uh, is that you have covered security um, in the cloud, but still what kind of mechanisms are available to the user for protecting sensitive data? Um, yeah, I, I can take this. Actually, you know, security is shared responsibility model. I mean, we have our part of security, you have your part of responsibility, I would say. But if you are speaking about protecting sensitive data by user, any service on Azure that um, tend to store data, like storage databases and everything, uh, can be encrypted using a key, obviously. And we suggest three ways of storing this key. You can use Microsoft provided key. In that case, Microsoft will generate key and store key in Microsoft site. You can generate your own key, use it for encrypting your sensitive data and store it in Azure, like Azure Key Vault. Not like, but that's the correct way to store it, actually. And we have even third option. You can uh, generate your key, encrypt your data and keep the key by, uh, by yourself. Don't even provide it to Microsoft. So in short, uh, uh, we provide all necessary tools to control your data and encryption of your data, storage of data and, and everything. Okay, thanks Levon uh, for a very satisfactory answer. Uh, another question um, coming here um, is that, uh, what are the potential benefits and drawbacks of migrating to Azure Cloud and how do this compare to other cloud service providers? I think I will let David answer because I'm Microsoft guy, so my answer will be not so objective. Oh, uh, Maya, would you please repeat your question? <laughs> sure. So, so what are the potential benefits and drawbacks of migrating to Azure Cloud and how do this compare to other cloud service providers? Oh, uh, let me... Uh, uh, not answered uh, comparisons uh, uh, with other cloud service providers, but potentially there are uh, 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 key benefits that you can uh, uh, use uh, uh, while um, moving to, uh, to Azure Cloud. Uh, uh, rich documentation, for example, or uh... mm -hmm. so yeah, uh, I think um, the benefits um, have been thoroughly discussed as well. I mean, the cost cutting benefits, uh, the efficiency. Uh, so um, to come to the next question, um, someone is asking there that they are looking for multiple cloud enablement partners uh, what criteria should they pay attention to um, what are some possible red flags uh, again to back to uh, what we were uh, overall discussed even if it will be multi-cloud uh, approach we should uh, uh, pass through the discovery stage. We should pass uh, through the uh, motivation stage where all business outcomes should be uh, in detail considered. And then we can switch to the planning stage where we can design uh, or identify a multi-cloud solution approach. Mm -hmm. So um, um, the processes should be in place um, with the vendor uh, who is um, guiding through cloud adoption journey. Uh, and what about uh, the skilling and uh, certifications maybe of um, employees and team members? Uh, what would you mention here? Uh, uh, this is really important uh, point that uh, 
uh, skilling, uh, certification, and experience in, uh, uh, is a critical point to always consider. And uh, we, uh, as a WOLO, we are a majority of our engineers are certified. We have certified uh, cloud architects, Azure cloud architects, uh, uh, DevOps experts, uh, and uh, security and network uh, engineers, uh, uh, certified, uh, uh, Microsoft certified, of course. Oh, thanks so much. Um, this was um, a very good point. Um, another thing, um, uh, well, I would I would like to combine maybe, and I think these questions are for you, Levon. Uh, someone is asking, um, is there any regulation or policy by cloud provider according to which uh, to provide uh, the data to local officials by a request? Mm -hmm. Yes, the short answer is yes. There, there are clear regulations when data can be provided. I can name all these regulations. That's very like juridical hard language. I am not an expert on this area, but it's easy to, to find in which cases, in rare cases, I can say uh, clearly, the data can be provided to government, either local or international uh, security services. Um, mm -hmm. You can just find it easily in any search engine. There are regulations. Okay, thanks, Levon. And uh, we have a question here um, on why would we, um, uh, why would someone migrate from uh, Google Cloud to Azure? Well, um, I think uh, here maybe a combined answer uh, from you, David and Levon, um, would be uh, good to have because we as Bolo, we are uh, Microsoft certified. We have a team of um, experts uh, working on Microsoft Azure and also. We have all Azure solutions uh, designations to be able to um, guide through uh, the cloud adoption, through the right cloud adoption. So um, here may be a, a brief um, answers uh, from your side. Why would uh, we migrate from Google Cloud? Do you, do you want like absolutely honest answer? If you are satisfied with your, with your cloud, Google Cloud infrastructure, you should have moved to Azure. Why you should do that? So if you have motivations to move, okay, let's discuss it. If you're satisfied with your infrastructure and everything is fine there, why to move? Uh, but before to say, uh, if someone writes the question, then I believe there are uh, hidden uh, to topics or hidden uh, points that uh, we can discover and we can, of course, uh, we can sit and discover if there are something that uh, uh how do you currently benefit uh, uh from google cloud and what is your next uh, uh plans or uh, strategical plans uh, in the future and uh, what are you expecting from uh, your current cloud provider mm -hmm. uh, those are the questions they can definitely raise discussed and then we can identify maybe yeah because it's it's not a question that can be answered in a one shot that i i i never say azure is good and google is bad or vice versa yeah it's mm -hmm. not about that yeah absolutely so just to um quickly recap the answers um of our two speakers is that once you have uh, business problems and you're not satisfied uh, with a given cloud provider, then definitely with the help of uh, the right guidance from an equipped partner, uh, the, uh, you can leverage the benefits that the Azure cloud has to offer you. Um, I believe, um, let me just check for the moment if we- uh, th There's a question, good question, I uh, saw. So is there any regulations or policy by cloud provider according uh, to provide your data to local officials by request? Uh, yeah, I answered already. Yeah. I answered already. Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes, so there are uh, actually um, the policies and requirements. Uh, thanks everyone for questions. I believe we had, um, you know, um, 
quite challenging questions, but um, of course, um, if uh, if it's a real life case of um, given uh, um, enterprise being dissatisfied with the cloud performance with one or another um, provider, of course, uh, the thorough answer might require a one on one discussion about the real case. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us today. I believe we can wrap it up here and stay tuned to our channel to see which topics will be discussed next in our webinar series. Um, thanks, Levon. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. So see you next time.